Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, this should work. So thanks for the invitation and um, uh, I'm really fascinated by, by this topic and by the keynote yesterday. And I hope um, this, will, this will look like a little detour because we're leaving American, also European context at first, but I think it might bring us back to, to these questions. So we are in Japan now uh, first and for well over two decades now, there is this term kyara here that uh, has been circulating throughout all these books and many, many more in Japanese studies about popular culture, about philosophy, about all these things. And initially it was just an abbreviation of this English loan word kyarakta, which is character. And, uh, but for the no most part now, the concept of kyara carries the assumption now that the, the yeah, protagonist's phenomenon in question must be distinguished from ordinary protagonists of books, films, theater performances, historically, categorically, and yeah, maybe even ontologically. Um, the manga theorist Ito Go uh, proposed in 2005, in, in yeah, the, this very famous book in the middle, to use Chiara as a technical term for fictional entities in a proto-character state. So visual anthropomorphic configurations without any narrative context. Chiara seem to exist in denial of any fictional worlds or stories surrounding them. So we have virtual idols and uh, like Hatsune Miku or corporate icons, um, mascot characters or pure product placement figures uh, of prefectures, of uh, institutions and so on. Um, Chiara can also be found on um, street signs, uh, instruction manuals, post offices, corner stores or super supermarkets. This was indeed the topic of my a dissertation and uh, because there is the, the notion that there has been a characterization of Japan that is kind of a truism by now, so there's a wandering exhibition about that. And the prototype for all of these characters without story is um, Hello Kitty. And uh, Hello Kitty um, circulates predominantly on um, character goods, Kiara Guzu. So material objects such as clothes, coffee mugs, office supplies, handbags, cell phones, tags, or towels. Um, often these um, yeah, represented entities on Chiara goods are also referred to as pure Chiara as they are not derived from or filtered by narrative media or represented worlds. Instead, they seem to address their recipients more personally and directly, not through some fourth wall that has to be broken in the first place. And um, their success has been taken up by the Japanese uh, tourism industry during the early years of the new millennium um, yeah, with notable effects on the development of new Kiara types. So we have, we have regionalized kitty products, Gotoji Kitty, that uh, presents the cat in ever-changing site-specific roles, settings, and context as if there was a decontextualized entity behind all her contextualized roles or instances. Because when Kitty is depicted as a mountain, uh, Fujisan, <laughs> there can be no longer any kind of coherency between the narrative information, if you want to call it like that, in other representations. So there is the mechanism that Chiara function very much like fictional actress performing any number of incoherent narrative roles. And this is important to the most um, uh, important mechanisms of so many Japanese franchises. So another example would be Hatsune Miku, Initially, uh, uh, the idol existed only as the artificial singing voice of a, a synthesizer, a Vocaloid 2 synthesizer. And then a manga artist, Kei, provided this iconic drawn body. And then she went through a fast um, yeah, career as a pop culture icon. Um, few of her countless instances in fan-produced videos, artworks, shows, and so on, are bound by the requirements of any diegetic coherency. So she might appear as a medieval princess in one video or as an early 20th century American circus star in another or as an Edo style a Japanese warrior. If characters without story worlds are considered pre or proto narrative, they also, as we can see here, function as hubs, interfaces or intersections for aesthetic, medial, social and especially narrative diegetic forms of recontextualization. So consequently, every Chiara could also be addressed not only as proto-narrative, but also as a, a meta-narrative nodal point. That's a term by 
Asuma Hiroki. So in the following contribution, um, I would like to show how these perspectives are also valuable uh, for lots of characters that we are surrounded with in the uh, so-called West, mascot characters and uh, here working characters that's from the Paris Metro. Um, Max Malwurf, you know him, it, whatever, maybe. And um, how we might relate the pre-narrative state to the narrative state and the meta-narrative state of these entities, beings. So I propose to think of the um, pre-narrative, uh, the narrative and the meta-narrative uh, in terms of a uh, semiotic triad. I will show how. So that it's not meant to replace existing notions of transmedia characters by people like Paolo Batetti, Jano El Toon, Margolin, but rather to complement them with a more detailed account of their um, maybe socio-phenomenological modality. So if we build on Paolo Bertetti's model of transmedia characters, we might presuppose that, I quote, instead of considering the fictional character and entity inscribed in the text itself, we see it as a semi-pragmatic effect produced by texts, the result of an interaction between text and receiver. A character can be the overall result not only of a single text, uh, but also of a diverse series of texts producing a semiotic object. Other theoretical options to conceptualize the semiotic object would be uh, Edas Otton's notion of a intersubjective communicative construct. And um, I would like to relate this to, um, yeah, to a small um, application of um, Charles Sanders Peirce semiotic um, grammar. I'm not going to bore you with details. You know this already. That's the basics, right? A sign or representamen is something which stands to somebody for something else. Uh, the sign stands for something. It's object by means of an interpretant. So Peirce has a very wide understanding of what semiotic objects might be. They may comprise singularly existing things, but also a collection of such things or a known quantity or relation of fact. An object, in short, can be anything that is um, mentally present in the process of comprehension and interpretation of medial artifacts in our case. We could then distinguish between the private or mental and the intersubjective facets of these objects. Um, taken as immediate objects, we ask for the mental and cognitive processes involved in reception that are likewise um, investigated by cognitive semiotics or cognitive narratology. Peirce also developed a conception of uh, dynamic objects, uh, which must not be confused with the immediate ones, um, although it's not taken to be something um, entirely different. A dynamic object can instead be seen as the intersubjective approximation of the same immediate mental uh, object or how it could be apprehended outside of the personal and the private. It is, uh, that's a quote, uh, uh, well-known quote, it is the object outside of the sign. Uh, the immediate object is um, represented uh, by media, whereas the uh, dynamic object is determining the representation. So how can a yeah, comprehension and interpretation be determined by a fictional entity? One might ask something that obviously does not exist materially. Um, to purse Fictional representations like those of a phoenix, that's his example, uh, often, or Hamlet, may also be said to possess dynamic objects or even be determined by such. Recipients are usually uh, well aware that their private imaginations, interpretations, that might be very different for every one of us, may to a lot larger or smaller degree be shared or agreed upon by a given community within a specific context. Um, that are also familiar with the respective texts and artifacts. So in other words, the dynamic object of a fictional character representation may very well be constructed with recourse to a kind of normative abstraction of ideal reception processes. So comprehension and interpretation as it should occur within a given community. Whether we, we um, want to um, yeah, depend that on the hypothetical intentions of the author, of other recipients. That's not the point here, but it's um, that there will be always, um, you distinguish your own um, imaginations from something that others might also agree upon. And then there will be points of discussions where the, where, where the no negotiation starts. So, so that's um, 
very theoretical. I'm um, afraid I have to do this once more. Uh, Peirce, most foundational categories, um, that's his distinction between firstness, secondness, and thirdness uh, in the most basic understanding, the mode of potentiality, of factuality, and of regularity. And these yeah, yeah, phenomenological categories, I would say, can be applied back in a recursive fashion on all the individual relations within the triads of representaments, objects, interpretants. So for the present purpose of this, sorry, um, I would like, my, like to make this very easy and investigate the application on the logical interpretant in relation to the object that is the character or the chiara. So, and this representamen is itself the uh, aggregation of many earlier um, interpretations. So we have maybe uh, the iconography, a proper name to which a person schema has been applied, world knowledge, generic data database knowledge, and so on. When we speak of a contextualized story world character in the narratological sense, um, then uh, we speak of something that is represented or supposed to exist in the mode of factuality. It is something that has the attribute of existence within the supposed world. All story worlds are necessarily propositional, at least in part. The narrated world is, strictly speaking, a world of singular facts. Or as uh, Gerald Prince put it, if narrativity is a function of the specificity of the sequences of events presented, it is also a function of the extent to which the occurrence is given as a fact in a certain world rather than a possibility or probability. The ha hallmark of narrativity is assurance it lives in certainty. So these narrated facts may be about uh, who did what to, to and with whom, when, where, why, and what fashion in the world to which recipients relocate to take up a definition by David Herman, David Herman about a story world. Um, so all of what is represented in this, um, in this state must be, or at least in theory should be, uh, it should be possible to connect an interrelated in spatial temporal, causal, and ontological relations. We cannot do that in all cases, but we expected that it should be possible if we um, kind of relocate to this hypothetical possible world that a narrative represents. If the, re the relation of the logical interpretant um, towards its object is taken to be rheumatic, firstness, in contrast, it will have the tendency to focus on the qualitative characteristics of the object. So per typical example for this is a general term such as a human being, whichever it is, us probably, if it's not inserted into any proposition. So this is the mode of pure potentiality or the pre-narrative state in which the uh, respective Chiara representation have, has only the potential to trigger imaginations about possible individuals. So this is also where we could discuss now database and database uh, consumption uh, in Asuma Hiroki's famous um, model here. Um, yeah, database reception is then um, engaged mainly with the effective elements of Chiara representation, such as maiden uniforms, cat ears, bells, and so on. And uh, we can still distinguish between uh, private and intersubjective objects. Uh, the former would be strictly um, yeah, personal um, associations, maybe based on, on, on private memories, uh, while the latter are part of the databases of generic knowledge shared by fan communities. So a mecha suit means this and that can happen, for instance. Um, so here visual markers may be connected to generic traits. A Chiara whose visual appearance confirms to the trope of a Tsundere, for instance, yeah, might appear cold and hostile in public, but we know she or he will be very caring in, in private. So there's this database knowledge. The effective elements that comprise a Chiara representation usually, usually form a recognizable iconography, a Zuzo in Japanese, which we can identify and reproduce um, yeah, in a variety of media and materials. We can draw um, kitty ourselves. We can thereby generate concrete expressions in which the pre-narrative Chiara might carry claims to exist again as a character, as a particular individual within a specific possible world. So this is a model um, I, I built from Ito 
we have a character in a story, we extract some kind of chiara and then we can place it back into a heterogeneous context where it might be a different species or maybe even a different gender if that's part of the nature radiation. But it's not the same character, but it's the same chiara. We recognize the iconography. And again, we could distinguish between our immediate private assessment, if this is still the same chiara, and our dynamic intersubjective approximation, and if both sides, the internal and external side of signification, can be mapped into each other, then a cultural subject emerges, as Rain Rod has called this. So not necessarily in terms of national cultures, but especially in terms of micro-cultural fan communities based on networks of practices. So even though we have to accept and share a common notion of regularity to be able to speak of the same iconography, yeah, that's still Kitty, and hence the same Chiara, no claim about the factuality concerning any character as a diagetic fa fact needs to be involved. Not even the parts of the iconography that are instantly understood iconically can be used for claims. So there was a yeah, huge outbreak that Kitty is not a cat, she is just uh, represented as a cat, but she can be a human being, whatever you imagine it to be like, even though we clearly see that here. We cannot make any factual claims about this because there is no uh, diegetic domain of, of secondness in, in this place. So I would argue that we can speak of a chiara when a specific mode of character, production, reception, or circulation is dominant, when for a relevant um, number of um, yeah, producers and, and recipients also, a transworld, transfictional or meta-narrative potential for character recontextualization is more salient or more important than any individual narrative contextualization. And whether this takes place or not is not strictly determined by the media materials of representation, um, but some of them might provide higher affordances for meta-narrative recontextualization. Um, for instance, if the, the relevant media are only material goods that um, yeah, um, leave out any uh, occurrences in time and space because there is no, no story world, or it's very, very um, incomplete. So while all of these descriptions might seem uh, um, very emancipatory, and, and usually in fan studies they are thought to be always like very subversive, um, I would say that the detachment of characters from mandatory yeah, coherent story worlds and authorial attentions um, the emphasis not on the narrative, but on the pre- and meta-narrative, um, does not have to be critical um, or parodistic by default. Surprisingly, character recontextualizations can easily feed into highly problematic identity constructs as well. And to analyze this, um, I would like to close with some observations on AFD charm. Um, a a pre-narrative nodal point, maybe a chiara of Germany's new right-wing movement. So this figure appeared in, uh, right before the uh, AfD party entered the German Bundestag in the first time in 2016. Um, in the fall elections, um, some um, Twitter supporter by AfD, the handle AfD John, has been operating this account. Um, lots of international newspapers and German newspapers reported about this. It's called the Kalashnikov of the net election campaign. And the mascot, this cute girl with party blue hair, quickly took up speed on populist message boards. So Reddit, subreddit, the Alternative, or um, 4 chans uh, um, Krautchan, politically incorrect. So uh, here, AfD Chan acts as an interface or a node that connects memes, posts, and comments. She circulates in lots of draw threads and Photoshop manipulations where users compete with each other to creatively recontextualize her in always. Um, new, in many new ways. So she's depicted as a fervent fan of um, the right-wing fascist Björn Höcke as criticizing the German um, abolition of the imagined German people, um, as defying the mainstream lying press, and so on. So within the utterly unironic limits of national self-assurance, AfD Chan's identity uh, remains remarkably fluid. And this is precisely, I would say, where the mascot's frightening, agitating power seems to lie. Some draftspeople sent her backwards in time through history as an allegorical watch on the River Rhine. Others create photo montage of her as yeah, Frau Petri or Frau Petri as FD Jan or as a hybrid being in between. And um, some scenarios present her with other um, pre-narrative entities like um, the 19th century German Michel of caricature, has no story also, or the um, uh, People the Frog, uh, another 
pre-narrative character um, appropriated by the American alt-right movement. It turned out that, that a um, pre-narrative Kiera gain a, a life force, a same kan or sonsai kan, a presence and a life form when they circulate through a variety of works while they are continuously reappropriated and transformed by their fans and recipients. So a unified authorial agency can control a character by means of authorship and, and canonization, but not a Kiera because the Kiera's authorship rests by definition within the participatory communities within the network of communication and the media life of its own happens and occurs in a way. And it's precisely these popular aspects of Chiara that also have a populist affordances. So IFD Chan does not care about those above who have the power. She apparently belongs solely to the imagined people. A construct that can be experienced firsthand and reaffirmed as a communicative, commu uh, yeah, communicative community. So IFD Chan's pre-narrative presence of identity functions as a meta-narrative nodal point for xenophobic articulations and it constantly foregrounds the community it is based on. So for the participants involved, the practice and the, this practice functions as mirrors or amplifiers of these imagined communities. So I would say that in order to better understand decontextualized meta-narrative characters in their predominantly pre-narrative states and in order to criticize also their many cultural functions and uses, a narratological story-centered approach might not always be helpful. There is thus a need uh, for a refined vocabulary to conceptualize and analyze the pre-narrative character state that I have shown, so the practices of de- and recontextualization and the social negotiations within the participatory nodal points of the meta-narrative. Japanese thinkers and theorists offer a rich first toolbox to address um, yeah, many relevant phenomena in Western contexts as well, I would say. Thank you for your attention.